Good, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 39th George B. Hartzog Jr. Awards and Lecture Program, which is co-sponsored by Clemson's Institute for Parks and the U.S. Play Coalition. My name is Bob Powell, and I'm the director of the Institute for Parks. This year's event is particularly important, not only because we are here to recognize and celebrate the legacy of George B. Hartzog, Jr., the seventh director of the National Park Service, native of South Carolina and longtime Clemson supporter, but also because our parks face unprecedented threats and challenges. This long running program highlights Clemson's commitment to supporting the management and protection of local, regional, and national parks that provide valuable spaces that are important to our quality of life, health, and overall well-being. As part of the Hartzog program, which took place earlier today, we recognize four leaders in the parks and conservation field who I'd like to acknowledge now. As I read your name, please stand and be recognized. Sarah Milligan Toffler, Executive Director of the Children and Nature Network. She was presented the Fran P. Manella Award for Sustained and Innovative Achievement by a Woman in the Management of North America's Natural, Historic, and Cultural Heritage. Dr. Jeffrey Skibbins, Assistant Professor at Kansas State University, was presented the Dwight A. Holder Award for outstanding work, work that fosters understanding, wise use, and conservation of natural and cultural resources. Dave Halleck, superintendent of the Outer Banks Group, which includes Cape Hatteras National Seashore, has presented the Walter T. Cox Award for sustained achievement in public service, providing leadership, and influencing public policy affecting our natural, historic, and cultural resources. And lastly, Professor and Chair of the Department of Forest Ecosystems and Society at Oregon State University, Dr. Troy Hall, was presented the Benton H. Box Award in recognition of the teacher who inspires the quest for knowledge and the development of an environmental ethic as well as demonstrates leadership in preserving and enhancing our natural environment. Can we have another round of applause for these award winners? So it's now time for me to introduce our lecturer. Florence Williams is the author of The Nature Fix, Why Nature Makes Us Happier, Healthier, and More Creative. Florence studied English and environmental studies at Yale University, where she won the John Hersey Prize for nonfiction. She also completed a Master's of Fine Arts degree from the University of Montana. In 2007 and 2008, she was awarded a mid-career Ted Scripps Fellowship at the Center for Environmental Journalism at the University of Colorado Boulder, where she focused her time researching and writing about environmental health, including cancer and reproductive toxins. She is also author of the award-winning book, Breasts, A Natural and Unnatural History, which in 2013 won the Los Angeles Times Book Prize in Science and Technology and the Audi Award. Florence is a contributing editor of Outside Magazine and a freelance writer for the New York Times, National Geographic, and numerous other publications. The recipient of a 2017 Gracie Award for podcasting, she is the writer and host of a new podcast series, The Double X Factor for Outside Magazine. A fellow at the Center for Humans and Nature and a visiting scholar at George Washington University, her work continues to focus on the environment, health, and science. Finally, she currently serves on the board of High Country News and the Ted Scripps Fellowship Program and lives with her family in Washington, D.C. Won't you join me in welcoming to Clemson University the 2017 Hartzog Lecturer, Florence Williams. Thank you, Bob. Hello, Clemson. Hello. Happy Halloween. I promise that anyone who stays for the whole lecture will have free candy at some point this evening. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's really, it's a pleasure to be here. I am a huge fan of the work that goes on at the Institute for Parks and also the U.S. Play Coalition. And it's been such an honor to spend some time over the last day um, just being inspired by meeting the award recipients and by meeting the researchers who do such important work that makes my work as a journalist both enjoyable and easy. So it's really an honor. And also, George B. Hartsock, I'm learning about him and his legacy. And so it's, I, I feel very honored to be here. Thank you for having me. And I'm curious, I just wanted to start out by asking, it's a little hard for me to see with these lights, but um, I'm curious, I'd love, love you to raise your hand if you are over 50 years old. I know it's hard to admit it, but okay. And um, of, the, of those who have your hands raised, how many of you played outside as children every day? And I mean unstructured, not on a sports team. Okay, so that's a lot. Okay, now raise your hand if you're under 25. Okay, how many of you played outside every day not on a sports team? Okay, that's pretty good. I think this is a self-selecting crowd. <laughs> <laughs> because you're here from the Institute for Parks, but trust me when I tell you there has been a dramatic shift in the amount of time that kids today spend outside compared to a generation ago. And in fact, I would argue that we are living in the middle of the largest mass migration in modern human history, and it's the migration to living in cities, and it's the migration to living indoors. And yet I think it goes very unremarked upon in general. That migration actually mimics or mirrors my own personal story, and that's what inspired me to write this book. I moved from living in a town that had a backyard that looked like this several years ago to having a backyard that looked like this. So I went from having trails in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado and Montana before that, right outside of my back door, to now living in the middle of Washington, D.C., where to get to a natural trail, or natural-ish trail, I have to scramble down um, a steep embankment, cross a freeway, um, cross this railroad trestle with a chain link fence, pass a bunch of graffiti, <laughs> which is always very entertaining, depending on the week. Uh, and then I get to walk along the Potomac River, which is beautiful, but it's also the flight path for Reagan National Airport. So every 90 seconds, during the day, there is a low-flying jet overhead. And what happened to me as I made this migration was that I felt like a cortisol bomb, like a stress bomb, had gone off in my own brain. Uh, and, and my whole emotional inner landscape seemed to respond to what was going on in the outer landscape. I was really stressed out. The noise, I never realized I was sensitive to noise, and this was something I started noticing. Um, the traffic <laughs> was kind of dismaying to me. Sometimes I would burst out in tears in the middle of a traffic circle, and then I would end up in the wrong lane and end up in Virginia by mistake. <laughs> and the city itself, our neighborhood, was actually devoid of children. It was a moonscape, and there were no children playing outside. So I started to wonder why this was happening in my brain, why my emotional landscape was reflecting the outer landscape. I started to wonder about what the science had to say about this phenomenon that I was noticing. Because certainly, we've all heard these chestnuts about how being in a natural area is supposed to be so good for us and so restorative. Poets and philosophers have been talking about this for millennia, uh, from the ancient walled gardens in Persia, to the Greek philosophers, to the romantic poets. But it's also been in the last decade or two that these insights have started to kind of enter the academic and research landscape. And so I ran across a quote from the University of Michigan, psychologists and neuroscientists, and that quote is, imagine a therapy that has no known side effects, was readily available, and could improve your cognitive functioning at zero cost. Such therapy has been known to philosophers, writers, and lay people alike interacting with nature. So I thought, well, that's interesting. I would like to learn a little more about that. And around this time, I was fortunate enough to receive two magazine assignments, kind of in a row, from Outside Magazine and from National Geographic on the bicentennial of the parks. 
to talk about nature and the brain, or nature on the brain. One of the first places I went was Japan. Certainly poets like Basho had been talking about uh, the moon and frogs jumping in ponds, but that wasn't enough for scientific researchers. They wanted to actually quantify what was happening inside the human body, what was happening to the nervous system. And they started doing research. They found some pretty dramatic statistics um, from studies of people spending time, even just 15 minutes a day, doing something they call shinrin-yoku, or forest bathing. And this does not involve taking off your clothes, um, <laughs> usually. Uh, it, it really involves just hanging out in a forest, um, taking deep breaths, engaging all of your senses. I went to Japan and I learned about this because I went for walks with forest therapy rangers and I went for walks on forest therapy trails. I watched some of the science taking place. I actually had my own cortisol tested. And what they were finding was that in people who spend time in the woods, they saw a 2% drop in blood pressure, a 4% drop in heart rate, and a 16% decrease in cortisol. And at first I was a little bit skeptical of this because we know that there are many positive health and emotional benefits from exercise. And clearly people were sort of getting fresh air and walking around. But the researchers controlled for that by sending groups of people, students generally, also to walk around a city for the same amount of time. And they were really only seeing these changes, both these, quali these quantitative changes, but also qualitative changes in people's moods. They were really only seeing this in the people who were walking in the woods. And Yoshifumi Miyazaki, who really is leading a lot of these studies in Japan, posits that the reason for this, the reason for these positive health benefits, is because of stress reduction. And because of E.O. Wilson's Harvard biologist biophilia hypothesis which states that our nervous systems evolved in nature. We have a natural, inborn affinity for the natural world and for living things. And somehow, even subconsciously, we become comfortable and less stressed when we're in pleasant, natural surroundings. So that was one theory. Um, there were some others that I would soon learn about as well. But I continued my journey around the world talking to researchers and also real people who are achieving some of these benefits or trying to achieve some of these benefits. So I went to South Korea, which is kind of following the lead of Japan um, in having designated forests and parks that are specifically for healing, not for recreation, not for timber, um, but for actually what they're calling healing forests. And there are now 17 designated healing forests in South Korea. I went to one of these forests and uh, ran across a group of men in the woods. And I have to say they were unlike any group of men that I would run into in Montana. <laughs> there were no fishing poles. There were no um, shotguns. Um, there were no bottles of Jack Daniels. Um, these men were actually doing partner yoga <laughs> and they were having tea ceremonies and they were making floral collages and rubbing lavender oil into each other's forearms. <laughs> And it turns out that this group that I ran into um, was a group of firefighters with post-traumatic stress. And they were spending, it was a three-day program in the woods for them, um, also run by these healing rangers. And I, I talked to one of, the, one of the firefighters, and I said, well, what's this like for you? you know, are you enjoying it? And he looked at me, and he just sighed. And he said, I wish I could live here all the time. Science is being done there as well. Uh, here's one study that showed among forest walkers, there was a 75% decrease in feelings of frustration. And this is another program led by one of the 500 forest healing rangers in South Korea. Um, this is a woman leading a program in a city park, right, in downtown Seoul. And this is a program for teenagers, or preteens actually, uh, with digital addiction. Digital addiction is a really big problem in South Korea. Um, there is not a lot of outdoor free time for kids growing up there. They are in school all the time. They're in school during the normal school day. Many, many kids then go to school in the evening where they learn English. Um, really, some of their only outlets are indoor entertainments. And so they do. They spend so much time on their phones and their video games. Their mothers hate it. Their fathers hate it. Um, no one seems very pleased about it. Sometimes teenagers literally drop dead in the middle of video game competitions. So there's a lot of concern about it. And this woman is leading a program. Um, and if you see, well, in the, in the picture, 
here on your left, it's actually the mothers. She's doing leaf art with the mothers. Because if you have a preteen who's digitally addicted, addicted, you also need some time to de-stress in the woods. So there, she makes some, builds in some time for the mothers as well. And in the, in the photo on the right, she's taking an 11-year-old boy on a trail that's alongside a pretty steep cliff, and it looks like he's about to walk off. And you know what she said to me is, look, if we're going to possibly compete with video games, we have to provide some level of risk. We have to provide some level of adventure for these kids so that all of their senses are engaged, so that they can learn um, to, to feel things in their bodies that they are normally not feeling. And in fact, the kids really did seem fully engaged. I went to Scotland. Scotland is a unique country in that they have a lot of forests and they really buy into the idea, there's actually a public health policy that states that everyone should have a right to live within 400 meters of a woodlot or a natural area. And uh, you know, that's about a quarter of a mile. And uh, so here's a, this is a program called Branching Out. And uh, this is a leader in that program. It's for people who are severely depressed and who have recently left institutions. So they're reintegrating back into society. They have about 10 people at a time going out with this ranger. And they're doing things like woodcraft, forest art. In this photo, they're actually um, making gargoyles that they're putting onto tree trunks. But they also do things like, you know, they learn how to make fires and they, they do outdoor cooking and they do some orienteering. And it's, it's a nice program for sort of um, learning how to be in a group of social people, learning how to be functional again without sort of the pressure of socializing. And that's one of the things the outdoors seems to offer. Social bonding, also a little bit of exercise, um, a little bit of fresh air. These are things that are sort of tangential, perhaps, to the nature experience, but seem to be really important as well. Um, and after this 12-week program, people are able to kind of go back to their lives um, somewhat. This is a similar program, 12-week program. This is actually a horticulture therapy program in Denmark. And again, um, 12 weeks, they go for about three hours a day. These are for people who have what they call worker burnout, which is not really a phrase that we use in this country, but I think we can kind of understand what that means. It's people who are really too depressed to go to work. They haven't been able to go back. Uh, and yet, after 12 weeks of being in, in this garden environment, sort of slowly opening up their senses, slowly kind of um, learning again how to be with other people, how to be together at their own pace, eventually growing some of their own plants and cultivating, uh, about 60% of them are able to go back to work. And that's actually a higher percentage than they are seeing from other, other therapies and interventions. And they're, get, they're having an improvement in symptoms of about 20% which may not seem that dramatic, but it's actually the difference between being considered sick and being not considered sick. And therefore, it's also the difference between able to go back to work and not. So there's a long waiting list for this program. Because it's in Western Europe, it's paid for by the government. I was also particularly enamored of visiting the forest kindergartens in Northern Europe in Western Europe, um, some of them, um, some of these countries have programs that are very popular. Um, parts of Scandinavia, about 10% of kids attend forest kindergarten. And kindergarten there is kind of actually considered through first grade. So there are um, a lot of these programs. And at first, again, I was kind of skeptical. I thought, well, you know, it's so cold. <laughs> it's so cold in Northern Europe. And it's raining all the time, and it's gray. And people said to me, oh yeah, but you know, we have a saying that there's no such thing as bad weather, there's only bad clothing. And so they're, they're, these kids are really bundled up if they need to be in um, these Michelin-like snow, snow suits and galoshes all the time, and they can tromp through the creeks in that, they're sort of impermeable. <laughs> and they seem to be having a great time. Um, and, and because they're outside, they, they are actually behind their peers in conventional classrooms in things like reading and writing and some academics. And they're a little bit behind their peers until about third grade. But then they catch up. And they actually are way ahead of their peers on measures of social, socio and emotional regulation, um, on factors like teamwork, leadership, um, being able to sort of self-soothe and find comfort. And these are life skills that kids need. And in fact, those skills are skills that they have throughout their life, lifespan. Um, the picture on the left is actually uh, an urban outdoor kindergarten. It's in downtown Edinburgh. And you see this little kid carrying a very sharp, kind of long 
branch, <laughs> and he's like waving it around, and no one is telling him to put it down, which I thought was interesting. And he was having a good time, and the teacher said, well, you know, if he bonks someone with it, you know, they're gonna get mad, and he's gonna learn not to do it. And so it's very experiential, uh, and uh, kids sort of learn by doing. In the photo on the right, I love this photo, it shows a young girl, she's probably about five, and she's climbing pretty high up in this tree, and she's using all of her gross motor muscles, all her muscle sets, um, she's having a great time. And I love it that there's this little girl on the ground sort of looking up at her and thinking, oh, someday I'll be able to do that soon too. And about the time that I was watching this, a little boy ran by with a hacksaw, a <laughs> three-year-old with a hacksaw, and I sort of exclaimed, you know, normal American shock at that site. And the, the headmistress of the school said to me, oh, you Americans, you're so nervous. She said, you know, we don't really believe in risk avoidance. We believe in hazard assessment. And we have assessed this, and we think it's OK. Uh, and again, they will learn by doing. I'm also I'm fond of the fact that this photo has girls in it. We don't often think of nature as a gendered space. But studies do show that girls who spend time outside when they're young experience greater self-esteem when they're older. Um, they have greater work parity also in, later in life. Uh, there's an adventure gap in this country between boys and girls. And, and this happens, we, there have been studies from teenagers showing that way more boys than girls consider themselves brave. And yet when they spend time outside being active doing adventure sports, that gap starts to close. Um, another study that I'm kind of fond of shows that in conventional outdoor classrooms, uh, outdoor recess spaces or play spaces, the boys tend to get a lot more exercise than the girls. And we know this because everyone's so concerned about childhood obesity. And so the kids were wearing accelerometers in these studies, and you can actually measure how much they move around. Of course, no one is really getting recommended amount of physical exercise. But the boys are actually getting more. And yet, in nature kindergartens, and in these forest kindergartens, the girls are approaching parity with the boys. We know that to be successful, kids need skills in self-esteem, they need resilience. And studies are, seem to be indicating that time spent outside really adds to those skill sets. Um, I think the question is why. I've talked a little bit about physical exercise, a little bit about adventure. Uh, I think another one, though, that researchers are starting to look at is this idea of awe as sort of a pathway to growth and development. And I'm fascinated by this. It's hard to define awe. <laughs> we know it when we see it. It's kind of something that blows our minds. But um, here's a definition I like. Uh, this is from Dr. Keltner, University of California, Berkeley. Awe is an emotional response to perceptually vast stimuli that transcend current frames of reference. So it has to be sort of vast, and it has to be somewhat unusual. And then it really grabs our attention. And what happens when we experience awe is that it seems to actually make us, in some ways, more community-minded. It makes us more socially-minded. Um, in some ways, it actually seems to make us better people, which I think is quite interesting. There have been studies showing that uh, even in a lab, if you show volunteers photographs of, for example, a jumping whale or a waterfall, even if you just show them these photos for two minutes, versus showing them photos of things like a shopping mall <laughs> or a freeway, there's a difference in behavior. And what happens is the people who have looked at the nature photos have, ha will then, in some studies, contribute twice as much money to certain social causes, or they'll fold twice as many paper cranes for earthquake victims. So there's something pro-social about experiencing awe. And by the way, awe is generally experienced about 70% um, about of the time that we experience awe, it's from experiencing it in nature. So it doesn't have to be nature, but often it is. One of my favorite studies is, again, from Dr. Keltner's team, the University of California. This is from a grove of eucalyptus trees on campus, and what he did was he sent groups of students to go gaze up at these very tall trees for just one minute, and he sent another group to gaze up at a tall building on campus for one minute. And in each scenario, a research technician sort of accidentally dropped a box of pens, 
in front of the students, in front of the volunteers. And it was the students who were gazing up at the trees who actually helped and picked up statistically significantly more pens than the students who gazed up at the building. Einstein said that the most beautiful emotion we can experience is the mysterious. Awe gives us perspective, and it makes us feel like we are part of something larger. As Emerson famously said, it dissolves the self. He said, standing on the bare ground, my head bathed in the blithe air and lifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. Awe makes us feel connected to each other, and it wants to be shared. This photo, by the way, is from a National Park Service unit in my city. This is from the CNO Canal. It's a Girl Scout troop in Washington, DC. But scientists wanted to know if some of these changes that they see on paper tests and qualitative studies can actually be seen inside the brain. What are the biomarkers for these kinds of behavioral changes? And so uh, a researcher at Stanford, uh, Greg Bratman, decided to image people's brains before and after sending them on 90-minute walks in a city park. This is the Stanford dish. And also along a busy street, El Camino Real in downtown Palo Alto. Uh, he was specifically looking at one part of the brain called the subgenual prefrontal cortex. And it's a part of the brain associated with negative thought cycles, with ruminative thinking. And that, in turn, is associated with depression. It's kind of the worry box. And what he found after imaging is that in the volunteers who walked in the park, but not in the city, he actually saw a reduction in activity in that worry box part of the brain. So, if we know amazing things can happen in gazing at a tree for one minute or in walking through a park for 90 minutes, Dr. David Strayer, a cognitive neuroscientist at the University of Utah, was wondering, well, what happens after three days in nature? He performed cognitive tests on outward bound students who were backpacking, and he was interested in creativity. Uh, he found a 50% improvement on tests of creativity just after three days of being in, in the wilderness. This is another test that he's starting to run now, looking at brain waves, EEG units. This is actually a staged photo <laughs> for National Geographic, but it's a very beautiful photo, but no real science is going on here. Um, however, real science is going on here. Uh, <laughs> This is down the Green River in Utah, Lador Canyon. This was a four-day trip. I actually was on this trip just about a little over a month ago uh, with a group of veterans, um, both men and women, with PTSD. So now, actually, it's, uh, they're sort of field testing this EEG study, uh, these brain waves. Uh, and of course, we've known from the literature that being in the wilderness can be an incredible place for self-concept, for dreaming about who we want to be, for recovering from deep trauma or grief. This is a photo from 1869 expedition of um, John Wesley Powell, who himself was a Civil War veteran. He had one arm, and he was exploring the canyons of the Colorado River and its tributaries. And what's, what's neat about this photo is that uh, I went back on this trip, and I think this is just about the exact same spot. And this is me, I'm sitting in this field uh, with an EEG cap on my head, and I haven't gotten the results back, but I was told, uh, sort of off the record, that I seem to be producing a lot of alpha waves, and alpha waves are the sort of prized, um, prized bra brain state sought after by surfers and Buddhists and poets that seem to indicate a sort of calm and relaxed stage. Um, they're not so easy to attain in modern life, and I know that because I actually ran around wearing an EEG cap <laughs> quite a lot while I was writing this book, and I wasn't able to attain alpha waves very often. I think one of the things that's so interesting about the wilderness uh, is that it seems to have some effects of being an antidote to PTSD, to post-traumatic stress. It seems to create some of the opposite kinds of conditions. So when veterans are suffering from post-traumatic stress, they tend to be very shut down. 
There's a lot of anxiety, a lot of flashbacks, a hypervigilant state that, um, it, rather than drawing them out, wants them to shut themselves in. And so many veterans, including some on this trip, don't often even leave their homes. And it was a big deal that they actually came out to the wilderness to try this. Uh, this is a veteran named Logan. Um, he says that the wilderness literally saved his life. He's actually been running rivers now for a couple of years, and he helps lead these trips. Uh, and you can see from his expression that he is not shut down. He has opened himself up to the environment. Your senses want to awaken when you're in a beautiful place and experiencing awe. You may see an eagle flying overhead. You may experience some dramatic weather. You, again, you're feeling your body. Uh, there may be a rock coming up <laughs> on the river right ahead of you, and you have to pay attention to it. Being outside can make some qualities in which you feel expansive, social, curious, inclusive, where you experience joy, you sleep better, and you're social. Unfortunately, more and more of us live in urban areas, over 50% of us around the world, 70% of us by the year 2030. And so we really have to figure out how to make nature accessible for all of us uh, and how to bring more nature into the city. I started to think of our nature exposure on a dose curve, and that's the way I ended up structuring the book. I ran across this idea of a nature pyramid, um, which is being popularized by the University of Virginia. And it's sort of the idea that you know, our bread and butter is really this bottom of the pyramid, and these are kind of the nearby nature elements that we're exposed to every day on a daily basis and that we really need. And this includes things like views from outside an office window, um, the gardens and the schoolyards in our neighborhoods, uh, the local and city parks. In the middle of the pyramid are sort of the more um, deliberate kind of visits that we might make to natural areas, uh, state parks or regional parks. And at the top of the pyramid are these kind of rarer but still important visits to deeper wilderness and deeper nature immersion. So why is urban nature so important? I've talked about some of the physiological responses, but there have also been a number of interesting large-scale epidemiological studies. Um, for example, there's a Dutch study of 400,000 people in urban areas which show a lower incidence of 15 stress-related diseases in people who live closer to green space, and that's after adjusting for income. There's a UK study of 10,000 people showing lower mortality rates. There's a Spanish study, again, in cities, showing higher and healthier gestational birth weights in people who live near green space. And more, most recently, there's been a Harvard <coughs> Nurses Health Initiative study showing a 13% drop in mortality in people who live closest to green space compared to people who live farthest away. Also a 13% drop in certain cancers, 30% drop in certain respiratory diseases, and a 32% lower risk of poor sleep, interestingly. So one of the researchers who ran that study, Peter James, says that there seems to be a link, again, between really stress reduction and these stress-related diseases. And he thinks that that and the social piece are kind of the strongest mediating factors. We know that people want to be outside. Oops. Um, there is uh, about an average of about 70% of Americans recognize that contact with nature is extremely important to their emotional outlook. And 83% of Hispanics say this. So it turns out that Hispanic respondents in this study, which is by J.D. Case, are actually the most nature-connected population of all, which is something, I think, to keep in mind for urban park planning, certainly. Parents also report over 90% of them say that nature makes their kids happier and healthier. And yet, as I pointed out earlier, kids are playing today at about half the rate that they did a generation ago. So what are some of the barriers for these families and kids being outside? Um, there are many, in including pressure on people's times, overscheduling, um, the temptations of technology, 
Um, but another one is certainly resource depletion and resource loss. So this is my city, this is Washington, D.C. And uh, in this, there's, uh, I can say that about 40% of Washington, D.C. in 1973 had a tree cover of 50% or more. So 40% of D.C. had a lot of trees. That figure is now 23, no, is now 13%. 13% of the city has what we would consider a lot of trees, which is a dramatic drop. Interestingly, though, I visited Singapore, which I consider the city of the future. It's really the third densest city on the planet. It's high rise upon high rise upon high rise. And yet during that same period, really over the last 25 years, even as, it has, as population has exploded in Singapore, the amount of green space and green cover has actually increased 25%. So this is through civic policies. Uh, it's through park management and creation of new parks. One of the policies says that if you're going to build an office building or a residential tower, you actually have to more than replace the green space that you take up. And so builders are doing this by putting uh, actually gardens on the sides of buildings. So you see buildings that sort of look like chia plants. <laughs> and you can see butterflies and birds flitting around them. You also see interior gardens, in, especially in workspaces, uh, where people have meetings and can do work. Uh, this is my hotel in downtown Singapore the Park Royal, and uh, my cab driver, when he dropped me off here, said, oh, you're so lucky you get to stay here, because when you wake up in the morning, you can just open your window and start grazing. <laughs> but it's not just in the fancy hotels and office buildings. In Singapore, you also see this en enormous effort to increase the park system. Uh, and this is through uh, just creating better quality parks, but it's also by linking parks and by daylighting some of the utility systems, like the, the water systems and the canals. And so now, that, now there are miles and miles, 300 kilometers of trails um, actually linking parks in, in working class neighborhoods throughout the whole city. We have to think about how to create spaces of awe and spaces of beauty in our urban areas. Of course, experiencing and interacting with wildlife is a surefire way to rev up the awe factor, especially in children. Uh, this is a program in Tacoma, uh, right outside of Seattle in Washington State. This is a snorkel trail in downtown Wellington, New Zealand. It's very close to downtown, and it's actually signed. So you can like put your snorkel in, put your snorkel on, jump in the water. <laughs> this is in my city in Washington, D.C. This is Randy Stotts. He's a former convicted felon. He now works for the Earth Conservation Corps, and he works with adjudicated youth. Uh, and together, they, rehabil they rehabilitate birds of prey. But of course, what they're also doing is rehabilitating themselves. And as one student who went through this program says, and this is a quote, these birds are doing exactly what you need to do in your life to overcome things, to soar. So the birds symbolize that. So that was a great quote showing that nature as a metaphor can be a very powerful healing tool. And this is from a new wilderness area right outside of LA, outside of one of the largest population centers in the country, it's the San Gabriel Mountains. Uh, and I think again, we have to really think about how we can connect more people to nature. It's gonna be one of the greatest challenges of the 21st century. We're gonna have to think about how to involve our institutions in this project. So our schools, our neighborhoods, our workspaces, and increasingly, medical practices. So I'm happy to say that there are actually about 75 parks prescription programs now around the country. Um, one of them is in my town in Washington, D.C., led by Robert Czar, doctor, pediatrician. And uh, in a study, he has found that when you prescribe nature to kids, not only do they spend more time outside, but their families spend more time outside too. I'm also really fond of a program in Oakland, California, led by a doctor a pediatrician, Dr. Nusheen Razani. And uh, she's working with local parks agencies to bus kids from the inner city to these parks about once a month. And what she has said, she has uh, a nice observation. Oops. Um, where she says, let's see if I can find this. My cursor is not being visible. 
Um, well, what she says is that intervening in health issues with nature is not just a fad. And she says what she sees that's so inspiring is that yes, it in increases exercise and it decreases obesity, um, but the most, the most sort of powerful thing to her is to watch these whole families spend time together outside. And she says what that provides for her is a sense of amazement and also you can see a sense of joy. So I think our greatest challenges ahead are gonna to be to spend more time outside, to take children outside with us, and to work on behalf of our cities and our institutions to make sure that that keeps happening for everyone. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. So Bob's going to help me. Maybe, Bob, if you can pick out the hands that are raising, because I can't really see you guys from the stage here. Thank you. Yes, great, thank you. A question about Finland. Um, I love Finland. <laughs> I spent some time there. I felt like even adults in Finland are still living out their sort of forest kindergarten fantasies. So the adults are frequently spending a lot of time in the woods in Finland where they are berry picking and mushroom picking. <laughs> um, they are cross country skiing for miles at a time, even in the dark. Um, they picnic, they sing songs. <laughs> it, it was really, inspiring to see how nature connected people in Finland are. And yet, Finland is experiencing a lot of the problems that many Western countries are facing in terms of increased levels of anxiety, increased depression. There's actually a very high suicide rate in Finland, a lot of alcoholism, a lot of obesity. And so researchers, public health researchers, are trying to figure out how they can help prevent some of these problems. This is a country with socialized medicine. They believe in prevention, and so they've been studying it. And um, they've come up with some very specific recommendations um, for Finnish people, and, and one of, it's like a dose recommendation, and it's actually a minimum of five hours a month of time in forests <laughs> to, in order to ward off moderate depression. And if you can get 10 hours a month, that's even better, but if you can maintain a five hours a month, which is a little over an hour a week, maybe two visits a week, um, you, can, you can ward off wild, mild depression. So I don't know if that will work for Americans, but <laughs> it seems, worth giving it a shot. I know I need at least probably 30 minutes a day uh, in my nat nature parks and my city parks. Uh, and I think it's, I, th I think, you know, in, in all sort of realistic assessment, you know, there is a lot of individual variability, right? There are times in your life when you're going to need a bigger nature fix than other times. And there are times in your life where you're going to need a wilderness immersion. If you are dealing with grief or trauma or something, some kind of big self-concept, um, so I think there's a lot of individual variation. And, and what I really encourage people to do is to pay attention to how they are feeling in different environments. And I think it's something we don't tend to do. You know, we tend to like march through the woods with our earbuds on. We tend to be multitasking. Um, we're still like processing our to-do list rather than um, thinking about the bird song that we're hearing or what season the tree buds are in, you know, in a particular week. Um, so one thing I really emphasize in the book is like, look, you know, at least take the earbuds out if you need a stress reduction. See how you feel. See what kinds of nature experiences 
are sort of most in sync with your kind of emotional desires. Some people love the ocean, some people love the woods. Some people love the desert. You know, pay attention to what you like and what helps you. Well, I think it does. I mean, probably what you're talking about are cultures that are still living pretty close to the land, still living in places where there are tigers and lions and elephants um, tromping through. And yes, of course, in those kinds of situations, um, it may not be a restorative experience. But I think most of the research that I'm paying attention to and a lot of the research that's being done is really sort of for the benefit of urban populations, whether that's in a third world country, and certainly all the fast growing megacities are in third world countries. These are countries that haven't really always put a premium on things like parks. Um, on preventing mental health problems. And I think the research will, can hopefully really guide some of the development of some of these mega cities. But certainly it's not always a priority when people don't have enough to eat, um, when they don't have jobs. But I think we're starting to recognize that access to nature is actually incredibly important for civilization. And that if we are gonna have mega cities, we're also gonna need to figure out how to keep people in those cities healthy and sane. Any other questions? I give a shout out, that's great. <laughs> um, just recently they were talking about uh, next year they're going to double the price of admissions to the, uh, or admissions to the national parks. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, that makes me really upset. I mean, I know they get money, but it's, uh, I've been to some myself. Yeah. Yeah, I heard that to get a backcountry permit now, you know, you have to pay $70. Yeah. And, and certainly that's going to be prohibitive. That's going to be prohibitive for, for young people. It's going to be prohibitive for lots of populations. And I think that's a tragedy. Um, I think it's a tragedy. How does that compare, like, internationally for other countries that have? A lot of the countries that I visited, um, South Korea, Japan, uh, the parks are free. Uh, you know, public health has become a priority. It's in the national planning documents, certainly in the forestry planning documents. Uh, it's in the documents here, but it's not necessarily something that is translating uh, across the board for the future. So I think that's, that's going to be a real, a real fight, I think, for people who care about this and care about access. I'd be curious to know if you have ideas. You work. <laughs> yeah, you guys are the policy experts, so figure that out. It'd be great. <laughs> Uh, one of your neighbors in Washington, D.C. has the idea that uh, wilderness is a golf course. <laughs> and, I think uh, I know who you mean. <laughs> can you tell me something good about the current administration in terms of uh, nature and preserving nature and uh, building more parks and improving the parks we already have? Mm, great question. Uh, I don't know if I can tell you very much that's good. I think the best thing I can tell you is that there are so many very, very dedicated civil servants who are very good and care about these things and are kind of holding down the fort. Um, and I think, you know, if they can do their jobs, they will continue to try to do that and try to prioritize preserving parks. I, I, I do think that the country is so enamored of their beloved parks. I think it would be very hard uh, to really make a lot of changes in terms of park Park protection. I'm concerned about national monuments. Those are certainly under assault right now. Um, and public lands are, are under assault. I mean, there's just no way around it. Uh, again, I think this is something that, um, that, that citizens have to step forward and say this is something we value. And I think most of them do. So I'm hoping that there will be, uh, you know, that, that this, things will come out on the right side. <coughs> Thank you, Florence. Is this on? Okay, great. Um, you do such a beautiful job of 
um, interpreting the research and telling stories and making it really real. So thank you for your great thank contribution. You, You're just a great, a great writer. And I just want to make sure that everyone in this room is aware that there is an organization actually working on this issue. Um, it's called the Children in Nature Network, and I. I am uh, privileged to work there. And a lot of the research that Florence referenced is in our research library, uh, which is free, and you can go there. Um, it contains over 600 peer-reviewed articles. It's the largest collection of scientific literature as it relates to um, nature's impact on people. Um, and I would also just encourage you, if you want to join your voice to this issue, um, I encourage you to come to our website and join the Children in Nature Network. And, um, get involved. Um, it's, uh, it's an important cause, and I agree, it's one of the biggest challenges we have in front of us. Thank you, Sarah. I'm a huge fan of the Children in Nature Network, which has done an amazing job of actually putting a lot of these studies on their website, putting it in one place, writing summaries that are very easy to understand. Uh, a lot of people want this evidence. We live in an evidence-based society. They want to know what the studies are saying, and the Children in Nature website is doing an amazing job of that, and also the U.S. Play Coalition. I talked about exploratory play. Uh, again, an amazing organization, and I'm a huge fan. One more question. Uh, you, you touched on this other question regarding uh, the danger of wildlife adjacent to cities. Um, and I, I was just thinking about your comment that this is probably a very self-selecting audience, and <laughs> we probably can't fathom not wanting to go out into nature. Uh, but the fact is that a lot of urban populations are afraid of nature for very valid reasons. And I'm just wondering if you can touch on some of the organizations that might be addressing that for urban populations and youth in particular. You know, I, I might turn that question back to this audience because I think that a number of you are, are going to be more familiar with those organizations than I am, and, and I'd be curious to know what they're doing. Who wants to volunteer? <laughs> Is Larry here? He's coming. Fran? Uh, thanks again for a great job and all that you're doing uh, on Nature Fix. I think uh, the key for the future, I think, is uh, figuring out organizations, Michael and others, that can partner together, share expertise, and as many of you know from the Park Service and everything like that, that's what I've always been about, is partnerships. Children Nature Network, U.S. Play Coalition, but uh, you also go to the National Park Trust, you go to, uh, we work with so many uh, different environmental groups from Nature Conservancy and others to try to partner together to figure out how do we do that. But also here, um, you know, schools, Montessori schools, others are very strong in some of their interests and efforts. So, you know, part of the role of the U.S. Play Coalition has been to try to pull partners together, share information. Children Nature Network has been trying to do that for uh, many years as well and have done a great job, again, with research in, in that area. But I think the only thing we can try to do is continue to share and, and, and try to share not only knowledge, but I think the caring that needs to go so that we understand that these pre precious resources are, are here and we need to protect them, but we also need to find a way to appreciate them and enjoy them in a way that protects those resources. And with that will come the health and the connection to nature, I think, to the future. Thank you, Fran. I'm so glad someone answered my question. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to mention to everyone uh, real quickly that Florence will be in the uh, lobby and signing her book, doing a book signing right after this event. But I wanted to, on behalf of the Institute for Parks, as well as the U.S. Play Coalition and Clemson University, uh, present you with a, a, to a token of appreciation and award oh, as wow. the 2017 Hartzog Lecture. Thank and you. And by the way, this is a tiger eye. That is beautiful. And this was uh, done by a local artist here. So. It's beautiful and it matches my shirt. <laughs> so as I mentioned, uh, again, many thanks on behalf of the Institute for Parks, uh, the U.S. Play Coalition. I uh, want to recognize the award winners again. Congratulations on the great, all the great work that you're doing. Thank you, audience, for coming, taking time out of your busy day to be here. Florence will be in the, in the uh, lobby behind here, and we have a reception set up as well. So please 
engage all of us, ask questions, pull Florence aside. Um, but again, many thanks. Thank you.